All right. Oh. Welcome back to Codex. Our speaker today is Lutz Varnke, who is an associate professor of mathematics at UC San Diego. Professor Varnke is interested in random graphs and processes, uh, phase transitions, and combinatorial probability. Today, he will talk about how the density of Costas arrays decays exponentially. Take it away, Lutz. Okay. Yeah. Um... Thank you very much for the chance to speak here. So everything I'm going to talk about today is joint work with Bill Carell and Chris Swanson. And it's really, I would say, at the intersection of uh, probability, combinatorics, and some, you know, um, motivated by applications in radar and sonar. So what are the objects really that we are uh, of interest for this particular talk? So they run under the name Costa Zeris. From a combinatorial perspective, I think of them as uh, permutation matrices with certain constraints. Okay, so we think of a, a nice, say, n times n permutation matrix, and each row and column we have exactly one. And the additional property of Costa's areas, which I'll define in the next slide, uh, is kind of of interest in certain engineering applications, and these constraints arise naturally in radar and sonar. Okay, so, so those are the objects that we want to, to look at. And whenever we encounter some, some new object, now we can kind of, in order to gain a better understanding of these objects, we can ask various kind of questions. So, you know, do these objects exist? How many are there? What kind of extra structural properties um, are there? And for this particular talk, kind of the, the motivating question is, you know, uh, sort of a numerative one, you know, how many are there? And so for the, for the main um, result that I want to just kind of uh, mention here, is it um, is that we resolve a certain uh, conjecture that was first formulated in, in the 80s about these these uh, uh, costas areas, which basically says that if you take the total number of uh, n times n costas areas and you divide them by all n times n permutation matrices, that this decays um, exponentially. Okay, so in other words, another way to think about it is these costas areas they're all permutation matrices with these extra constraints. And what this result here is telling you is that these constraints are, are pretty strong in the sense that the, the fraction of um, uh, permutation matrices that are costless areas is actually very, very small. And so, so that's one way to look at this results to say, okay, we are, we're really looking here at some, um, some counting question. And when you see such result, you might ask yourselves, okay, so why should we, why should we care? What is maybe the motivation here? I would kind of maybe mention three points is, one is that um, this of course translates into a, a natural um, enumeration result, um, uh, which tells you, you know, an upper bound of how many objects there are. Um, the other point of view, um, which is maybe my favorite point of view is that we can think of this actually as a question in probability theory, which then allows us to bring tools and techniques from probability into play because if we, uh, because we know that any costless area is a permutation matrix. So if we look at the uniform distribution among all n times n permutation matrices, then what this quantity um, that, 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 um, that we're looking at is really just asking, what is the probability that a random n times n permutation matrix is a costless area? Okay, this is really what this quantity corresponds to when we do a uniform sampling of n times n permutation matrices. And so, once we have this probabilistic perspective, it means that we can try to use tools and techniques from probability theory to answer this question. And um, the third motivation is, as I mentioned, is because you know, these costless areas, they're objects that arise in the context of these engineering applications. I think it's always interesting uh, to try to apply the concepts that we have to things that actually uh, occur in the real world and in applications. Again, um, if there are any questions, please feel free to, to ask any time uh, during the talk. So let's talk a little bit more about what these constraints are that these costless areas satisfy. As I mentioned, these were um, introduced in the 1960s by John Costas in the context of some Navy research. And there, you should think of them really as permutation matrices plus extra constraints. So in this case, we're gonna forbid certain configurations. So more formally, we say that um, 
the permutation matrices where all vectors between different ones are distinct. And I think this is one of these definitions where instead of thinking about what does it say, it's easier to see non-examples to understand the definition. So, so here are, I brought three um, non-examples of permutation matrices that are not costless arrays. And so um, the point here is that we can imagine between any two, two say ones, we can draw a vector like this one here or this one here. And the costless area condition would tell us all these would have to be different, but these are actually the same. So because we can imagine we do here one, uh, if we shift to the right one and up, then we get, then um, and we do the same here, then these two vectors here exactly are the same. Okay, so this is something that we don't want. Similarly here, this vector and this vector between these ones is also the same, also forbidden configuration. And the third type of configuration that you will forbid is something like this here, where um, these two vectors here uh, are connected. And again, um, by a row and column shift, you could bring these two configurations on top of each other. So they're forbidden. Okay, so, um, so another way to think of it was maybe you in general forbid something that looks like a parallelogram, where these two configurations here, they're kind of degenerate parallelograms in some sense. Okay. Okay. So, we don't want such vectors which are the same. And if you want, you can check now um, that no matter which two ones you choose here, maybe this one, this here, and so on, all the vectors here in this example are, are different, okay? So when you see such a, such a definition, you might ask yourself, so where does it actually come from? Because somehow this is maybe not the first definition that you would try to write down. And so, um, the, the way this is motivated is that we can think about some kind of um, uh, in applications of radar and sonar, what, what, we're, what you do is you kind of send out these pulses and then there's a certain, um, this, these costless areas will tell you how to send uh, these pulses. In other words, they'll tell you at which times and frequencies to submit things. So um, to be slightly more specific, imagine here that, um, these columns tell you at which, um, so imagine you discretize, discretize time, and then these uh, here columns, they will tell you um, uh, at which uh, time you want to send a certain uh, signal. And here, the rows will now tell you at which frequency you want to use. So imagine here you have a bunch of different frequencies, and this will then tell you here in this first time slot, send using that frequency. In the second time slot, use this frequency, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so what you do is you send out these pulses at different times and frequencies, and then they hit kind of some kind of target or object, and then you get some kind of um, uh, signal back, and then depending on the distance to the signal, you get some kind of um, shift in, in time, and depending on kind of the speed of the object, you get a shift in the frequency. Okay, so this is kind of assuming that everything is noiseless. So you send out these different uh, signals uh, at different times and frequencies, and then you, you get back something that is kind of shifted in, in time and frequency. And then if you want to kind of understand where is the object that I want to detect located, then that effectively reducing, reduces to figuring out what is the time and frequency shift of the pattern that I received compared to the pattern that they sent out. So your goal is to figure out um, what is this time and frequency shift that makes the pattern that I sent out and the pattern that I get back match up together or match as good as possible. Okay. And- So Lutz? Yes? Is there a, a, a reason from the application for forcing the cost S array to be a permutation matrix as opposed to any old zero one matrix? Um, so I read these articles by, by uh, this original paper by Costas, and he said that there's some um, engineering heuristic why maybe it could potentially be good not to use, um, uh, why it should be like a permutation matrix. For example, if you want to I think he motivates, for example, in terms of um, uh, energy, uh, consumption that you know if you want to send out the the signal uh, at a certain time then you want to put like as much energy as possible here uh, into uh, this one particular frequency that you use um, but otherwise i agree there um, in principle you could ask the same question if it's not a, a permutation matrix um, but, but somehow there, there was some sort of engineering reasons why maybe it's a good idea to use here a permutation matrix um, but 
let me maybe tell you, so far we've said, okay, um, uh, I told you that, okay, use it to send out these frequencies, then you kind of look back, what is the best way to match up these patterns? And so why is this cost this area property not good for this, for, this, uh, for this kind of way of figuring out where your object is? Well, the first thing is that whenever you do a shift um, um, of rows and columns, you can always match up two ones, right? If I take this, this pattern, and I shift this, this it's a little bit down and to the right, then I can always make two ones match up. Okay, I can always make two ones match up. So it's always possible that via some shifting of rows and columns, you you um, you can match up one particular one. But the Costas area property now tells you that if you don't do the correct uh, shifting of rows and columns, then either then then you can only match up at most one, right? Because if you would match up at least two then you would find a row and column shift where, for example, here, these two match up. That's exactly forbidden by a Costas array. So in other words, to another way to say it, this Costas array has a special property that either you match up everything or you match up at most one of the ones. So it's like this super big gap between the correct pattern and everything else. There's a huge gap in the number of ones that you match up when you try to figure out what is the correct row and column shift. Okay, and that is enforced by this particular quantity here that all vectors between different ones uh, have to be distinct. Okay, so um, that's what I wanted to say a little bit about where it comes from. Um, uh, and for the remainder of the talk, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what is this number of Costas areas, what is known and, and what can we say about it? Otherwise, I think this would be a good time to, um, to ask questions. Okay, so for now, let's take this um, this as a definition. Um, we think of it as a permutation matrix with extra um, properties. And so, so there has been a lot of results which try to understand, um, gain some insight into how many of these Costas areas um, are there. Um, in part, I was told it's useful to know how many uh, Costas areas there are for certain numbers because this can be used to, to find certain parameters in, in applications. Um, I think a lot of um, effort actually has gone in exact numeration, so exact trying to figure out exactly what the number of these costas areas is. So I try to plot this schematically here, where this is n, and this tells you um, the number of these costas areas. And if you do that, you get roughly such a kind of um, uh, curve. The precise numbers are not so important, but I do think that some insights can be gained by by this exact enumeration, in the sense that. Uh, at several points, for example, at this point up here, one insightful thing is that this number is not monotone. So if you increase n, it does not mean that you have more of these costas areas. And this typically, in the context of enumeration, is kind of a sign that the object you're interested in is quite uh, tricky or complicated if it's not monotone uh, increasing. And when they um, used more and more computer search to analyze this number, are somewhere around here, around say 27 or something, they also realize that this function is not unimodal. So it's not monotone, not unimodal. So, so it's definitely some kind of uh, weird function, this number of costas areas. And um, I think the current state of the art is something like 29, where they used like 360 years of CPU time, some I think 10 years ago, to figure out exactly what this number is. But that's as far as I know, still the state of the art. So we don't know exactly how many there are for n equals to 30. Okay, so there are certain bounds uh, for larger n, but we don't know the precise number. So, and for example, which is kind of curious, we don't know if there actually is one for n equals to 32 or not. Okay, which is maybe surprising. Okay, so but what what were the insights that people have tried to gain from this exact enumeration? I would say that there are two things. One is to get some insight into not only the number the behavior, but also some structural properties or constraints of these causes areas. So they, for example, proved certain properties which allowed them to speed up their backtracking search. You know, that you can maybe by symmetry, you don't have to test certain configurations, or if you have this big search tree, you can cut it off early because you know that you cannot complete it anymore by certain particular structural properties. And also people then uh, seeing these numbers, they actually uh, conjectured in the, the 80s already that you know, this number should become very, very small. Um, in particular, this ratio here should decay exponentially. 
that's what they interpolated based on these small numbers, which I find quite amazing, but um, that's what the prediction was. So that's what I wanted to say about exact enumeration. And the next thing I wanted to mention is asymptotic enumeration. So by asymptotic enumeration, I mean that, you know, so in many fields like um, random graphs and in other areas, somehow we often don't care about what happens for a very small n, like n 10, 20, 30, or 500. And, um, but rather we're interested often in what happens when n gets really, really large. So la n is large, but finite. And so part of the motivation or the reasoning there is that, you know, maybe for small n, there are certain special configurations or, or something special happens for small n that does not happen for large n. So in other words, if you look at large n, that kind of reveals the, 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 the core structure of the problem somehow. And this, is, this perspective has also been taken um, early on for this, uh, this Costas Aries. So um, in particular, um, understanding about what, how many there are. And some of these very early work by Gnome Taylor from, the, from 1984, it already implies that um, this number is non-zero for infinitely many n, okay? So what that means is that, um, for example, when n is a prime number minus one, then there always is a specific, is at least one such Costas area. Okay, so there's an explicit algebraic construction which tells you here's a way how to explicitly find such an object. And if you study these, these papers a little bit, then you see actually they prove more than just one, they actually get some almost n squared. So maybe n squared divided by some polylogarithmic term or something like this. So that's what these constructions give. And it has actually turned out that um, Gilbert had exactly the same constructions as one of the constructions of Gulom Taylor already in 1964 in the context of trying to construct certain uh, Latin squares. So that's the, the current state of the art for the, uh, for the lower bounds. And I'll, I'll maybe later give an example how such a construction looks like. In terms of upper bounds, um, already, um, so there were, in this paper by Gulom Taylor, they had some conjecture that this, uh, the number of costas areas divided by n factorial divided by here, the total number of n, um, n times n permutation matrices that should go to zero. And there, there are three independent uh, proofs of this, which all of them show that the number of costas areas divided by n factorial decays, say, polynomial. So what I mean is that it's something like order one over n. So in other words, this fraction of costas areas among all n times n permutation matrices, something like a one over n fraction. So it really, really gets small as n tends to infinity. And so this resolved one of these open problems from this Gollum Taylor list from 1984. Um, and so, so, as I said, there were three different proofs. One is here by Benjamin Weiss from, from Hebrew University, and one is by Victor Reiner, um, uh, who's now, I think, a professor in, in Minnesota. So, so that was the state of the art in terms of um, upper bounds and lower bounds. But when people looked at this data, this data that I made, you know, these plots that I tried to indicate here, there was kind of this conjecture emerged in um, that this number should actually be much smaller than polynomial. It should be something more like uh, exponential. Okay, so uh, when uh, here Drakakis updated this this paper from 1984, so this paper here contained like a bunch of problems regarding Costas areas. So when he updated this in 2011, he said that this would be one of the the core theoretical problems of of, of interest, um, and the reason being that this proof gives polynomial decay, but the if you plot the data, it's clearly, clearly much, much smaller than polynomial. It should be more exponential. So it's kind of seeing, okay, the experimental data shows us that there's a huge gap between theory and, and practice, and let's try to, to narrow that gap. Hey, Lutz. Yes? Is it known whether there exists an n for which c of n equals zero? So that's still an open, um, open. Okay. problem. Yeah, so... N equals to 32 is the smallest number where this is not known. Um, so yeah, I, I agree that maybe uh, it's probably from mathematical perspective, I think it's very interesting to understand whether it exists for all N, 
for the practical perspective, I, I don't know if it would make much of a big difference whether this, uh, you know, prime minus one restriction or not. I, I, I'm not sure. I think definitely from a mathematical perspective, it's quite interesting to understand that. Um, so, and the main result of this talk, yeah, we, we proved this exponential decay conjecture. So, um, should we show that there's some constant C, small c, so that the number of cosses areas among all n times n permutation matrices decays exponential n, so it's most e to the minus c times n for all n at least uh, three. So this, this verifies this, uh, what was advertised as this core, core problem and based on these speculations from the 80s. Um, the bound that, we, that we've written here, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of not too far from the truth. Um, and the reason is um, because this uh, uh, number of costless errors divided by n factorial is at least exponential n times log n for infinitely many n just by using these constructions that I showed you previously. So the lower bound is e to the minus n log n. The upper bound here is e to the minus c times um, n. Um, and in some, um, you know, uh, still unpublished work, we can get closer to this bound, I should say that. So uh, the, the real uh, truth here is, is really more exponential n times log n, not, not linear in n, but that's a separate story. Um, Furthermore, you might ask, okay, what about this n at least three? Well, that's just for technical reasons because this, uh, because all um, n times n permutation matrices are costless areas for n equals to one and two. You can check that. So this is also not an assumption. Okay, so so that's the result I want to tell you a little bit more about, and um, the way we prove it, and this I, I find quite nice is that we use some ideas which originally come from, from random graph theory, and now we apply it to this, to this costas area problem. Okay, and I, I want to tell you a little bit about um, what's going on there, but I think it's quite nice that you know, we use some ideas that we developed in random, random graph theory now to, to look at, uh, to study these costas areas. Um, so I think I'm going a little bit faster than I originally intended. So this is again, a good time to ask questions. Maybe going back um, one slide, you mentioned something that the one over n rate seems slow if you plot it. Um, how can you plot it if it only goes up to n equals 31? This is one of these- Because it's just more intuitive. I, 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 I yeah. agree. Um, so this is one of these things where um, I'm sometimes amazed that um, how people who work in, uh, in, in this area, how they can interplay it. So they only have this, this very small amount of data and yet they say, oh, clearly there's this big difference between um, um, this theoretical result and, and, um, and what we observe in this plot. For, for me, it's amazing to make this interpolation, but um, uh, definitely the number is quite small. So I think I can check. So for, for 29, the number is actually 164. Okay, so there are 164 costless areas of n equals 29. So um, yeah, so the numbers are, are, are very, very small. Um, okay. So I, yeah. I think that based yeah. on that, they just say, okay, 29 factorial versus 164, it's, it should be really much smaller than a- Right. right. Um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, is there, a, is the, the, the local minimum there at 16, is there any, intuition as to why that's occurring at 16 because it's surprising to me that six, 16 is not surprising but then that, that we have none at 32 like we don't no, no, know no. it's no, I, I, no no it's unknown for the right, right. That, that we we possess no costless arrays of size 32 is surprising like we can't, currently can't construct any but we know there's a local maximum at 16 is there any intuition you can give as to why that's happening there or is it just all computation um, I cannot give a good reason why here at 16 this maximum occurs. What I do know is that people have plotted at some point um, these numbers and they have actually matched them. Let me quickly check. I think, did they match it? So I think when the, when the curve was like this, people have, have matched it to a, um, 
to a certain function. So they, you know, based on the assumption that certain things are approximately independent, they came up with, oh, the number of costs area should be roughly this. And then they did some kind of um, parameter matching. And at least up to this point, um, what they got matched the, 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 the curve they fitted. But then later when people got high and higher numbers, it, it did not match anymore. So yeah, I think there's no good explanation at this point why at 16 this maximum occurs or why this again looks like here. Right. Uh, um, it, it could be that maybe this is all related to certain number theoretic things that are happening in the background that maybe for certain n, just there are certain properties that can arise that cannot arise for other n. Um, but I think that's still subject to, uh, to getting a better understanding of what's going on. So one thought I have in this, in this space is that like, like hunting for like a slight strengthening of a costus array where um, maybe think of a matrix of zeros and ones as mm -hmm. really a subset of ZN cross ZN. Mm -hmm. And then I would ask, let's call it the, the subset like D. Mm -hmm. And then I would ask for the set of all differences of D to have a histogram that would be like, I'm gonna have uh, N copies of zero because I'm taking a difference of each point with itself. Mm -hmm. But then I would want all of the other N squared minus N differences to be distinct. And there's enough room for those to be distinct. Um, in fact, there's, there's gonna be some flex of like N minus one spots that won't be covered. Um, if I have a subset of ZN cross ZN that satisfies that property, then the corresponding matrix will be a costless array, I think. Um, so then that, that feels friendly to like Fourier analysis type stuff. And it smells a lot like a different set, which is something that mm -hmm. a fraction of the audience thinks about. Um, and maybe that's a move that the algebraic constructions use, for example, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so, so this perspective of, of, of um, thinking of in terms of, of different sets, um, or, or in other words, you're, you're looking at all, if you, if you write it as a, if you take this perspective, where's my pen? So if, if you think of this here, you know, you can think of it as an X and Y uh, coordinate for each of them, right? Then you're effectively saying that, you know, what does it mean that the vectors are different? It means that if you say this minus this and this minus this, you're comparing all these, uh, all these differences. Um, so that, that uh, I definitely know how to exploit that uh, using um, knowledge about this algebraic cons uh, from, that comes from algebraic things like um, viewing it as a CDON set turns out to be um, advantageous um, for, for further um, improving this bound actually. Um, somehow that helps from the common thorough perspective to, to view it like that. Um, I think it would be interesting to understand what it means in the Fourier world, or how, how to how to exploit that better in terms of getting bounds on the on the counts. Um, I think that has not been used so far. So if you if you look back here into these methods, um, so this is all living in, in algebraic constructions, and and these bounds here, they're well, they're using basically pro some probability theory, like using the first and second moment. Um, uh, about a suitable knowledge about the first and second moment about the suitable random variable. And our proof would also use something similar, uh, uh, some knowledge about uh, how a certain random variable behaves. Th I think if one can somehow use the, the Fourier knowledge that might be um, interesting or open up some new set of tools. Okay, so for this talk, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, how we approach this, uh, th this, this problem. And so I, I think we have quite a mixed audience. So let me try to, to say a little about the, uh, more about the high level proof strategy, uh, what's going on. Okay, so first we, we are gonna do this something uh, combinatorial. We're gonna say, okay, um, our goal is just to get an upper bound. So in particular, we can kind of focus on uh, uh, some configurations which are not allowed. So in particular, what we discussed earlier here, this kind of configuration, um, uh, like this, where you have these three collinear ones, then 
uh, that's something we don't want. Okay, so what we're just going to say is that no costless array contains this configuration. So for the purpose of this talk, if we get an upper bound on the number of um, n times n permutation matrices without such a configuration, that's also an upper bound on the number of costless arrays. Okay, so we're going to say, um, let's just exclude this kind of pattern. Okay, three equally spaced collinear ones. So once we decided that that's the kind of forbidden structure we want to go for, now we can kind of uh, think of it again through the lens of probability. Because we, we said, okay, if we look at this number, the total number of costless errors divided by n factorial, that's just the number of costless errors divided by the total number of n times n permutation matrices. So this is just the exactly the probability that the random n times n permutation matrix actually is a costless error. So once we have this view, then we can exploit this first part that we discussed, which says that no costless array contains such a configuration. So if we denote by X, the number of such configurations in the random permutation matrix, that means that the probability that the random N times M permutation matrix is a costless array is at most the probability of X is zero. Okay, because if it's a costless array, X has to be zero. So this is an upper bound on this probability. And now the basic strategy is just to get an upper bound on this probability. Okay, so we've now completely moved to the world of, of probability. We just want an upper bound on this, uh, on, on this probability. And that's still a similar approach that was used in these, uh, um, in, 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 in this previous work here, which got this order uh, one over n um, uh, a bound. So um, they used what is the so-called uh, uh, second moment method to bound this probability. And the second moment method means that you need to understand kind of what is the expectation, what is the variance of your random variable, and then using Chebyshev's inequality, you can get an upper bound on this, on this probability. Okay, but using just some small moments, you will not get this uh, exponential type uh, error probability. And so, so once we uh, are at this stage, um, now what you might want to do is you might want to apply some, um, some concentration uh, uh, inequalities to this random variable in order to get some kind of um, exponential decay. Okay. Um, the tricky thing is, of course, here is that uh, the appearance of these structures, the appearance of whether um, uh, certain of these th these configurations are present in your n times n permutation matrix, they're not independent. Not independent, because, for example, here this might be a forbidden configuration, and something like this might also be a forbidden configuration where they share this particular one. So different forbidden configurations can share ones in your, uh, in your permutation matrix. So, so there's some kind of dependencies which make this um, a little bit tricky to deal with, okay? And so the, 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 the trick that, we, that, um, that we're using here and which I, I kind of maybe want to share because I, maybe this is also used in other contexts is that we're uh, instead of looking at the random variable X, which counts the number of these configurations, we're gonna look at a different random variable, which is better behaved with respect to these concentration inequalities. So I'm gonna expand on this on the next slide, but the idea is the following. X counts the total number of such configurations. So if you look here into this example matrix I have at the bottom, then there's this, these three ones and these three ones, they would both be counted by our, by our, um, by our random variable X, okay? So in particular, you immediately see that these configurations, of course, they share two ones, okay? And so for, for the purpose of con establishing concentration, it turns out that um, X is maybe not the best random variable to look at, but some variant of X. And so the idea is the following, that you want to find a large subcollection of these forbidden configurations, which don't share ones, okay? So you want to find among all collections of these um, forbidden configurations, how many, what's the largest subcollection where all of them are pairwise disjoint in the sense where all of them do not share a one, okay? So for example, here, once you count these, this configuration here, you're not allowed to reuse these ones for any other objects you're counting. So in other words, with respect to placing disjoint copies of your conf forbidden configurations, you only have space for putting down one. So either this one or this one, you cannot count both, okay? So, so somehow the idea is we want to count um, disjoint uh, 
such forbidden configurations where no two of them uh, intersect. And, and from the um, probability perspective, somehow, if they don't intersect or overlap, th there's some intuition that that's something good because things that are disjoint that depend on disjoint ones, we think of them that they're more, behave more like independent objects. Okay. So let me um, just expand on that uh, again. So we started off by asking, okay, what's the probability that the number of these forbidden configurations is, is, uh, is zero? And then instead of bounding that quantity, we bound a different quantity, namely the maximum size of a collection of these three one configurations that are disjoint, okay? And so in particular, if there are no configurations at all, then the number of disjoint configurations is also zero. Okay, and so it turns out that this is the, the random variable that is much better behaved um, with respect to these concentration inequalities. And if you if you um, if you work on this, then out of that you can squeeze out this exponential decay. And so now you might say, okay, where does this come from? Why should this random variable be better than than this one? Okay. And so um, so the 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 intuition there is okay. One of the things I mentioned earlier is that coming from random graph theory, I usually think of if we count disjoint configurations, it's more independent than uh, like looking at configurations that can overlap. But there's also a concrete technical reason uh, behind this. And so, um, so there are some nice uh, inequalities, which in the, in the random graphs literature and so on, they usually call them like bounded differences type inequality, but they're really, um, uh, consequences of um, martingale inequalities of, of a super hefferding type. And they basically say that if you look at some random variable Z, where this Z depends on your some random permutation, then if you want to establish some kind of um, bound on the probability that your random variable Z is zero or that it deviates from the expectation, that can be very closely linked to how much your random variable can change um, under any kind of transposition. So you can imagine that, you know, the basic building blocks of some permutation, you can think of them as, as transpositions, right? You can represent any a permutation um, by transpositions. And somehow one transposition is kind of the minimal change you can do to a, to a permutation. And if your random variables is, is nicely behaved in the sense that whenever you, you start off with Z for some permutation, then you modify your permutation by one transposition if then your random variable Z does not change too much, that is good for the purpose of, of, of concentration. Okay, and um, to, to express that slightly more quantitatively is that imagine you're interested in over all possible permutations pi and over all possible transpositions tau, what is the maximum that Z of pi can differ from Z where you apply this transposition to pi? Okay, so that, that kind of quantity is what determines what strong of a concentration result you can you can get. And with respect to this parameter, this random variable x and this variable uh, where you just look at disjoint ones is, is very, very different, okay? Because suppose here we're looking at our disjoint uh, random variable. Well, because with a transposition, you're flipping two ones, okay? You're, you're flipping effectively two ones in your matrix. But if you just look at these disjoint configurations, then each of these ones can be can be can count or can be contained at most one of these forbidden three configurations that you count. So if you do this change of pi by a transposition, you can change the total number of disjoint objects that you're counting by at most two, simply because with your transposition, you're just affecting these two ones. But if you do the same for the original random variable, this change by one transposition can change the total number of these three configurations you count by a linear amount can be changed up to n. And um, one example where you can check this, I'll not do this here, is that if you just take, for example, just the, this, uh, this um, identity matrix where you have this all ones and diagonal, and you just flip the, the bottom two, two, two ones here, this will lead to a, a linear number of, um, of, of these uh, configurations that you change. Okay, so in other words, if you change your underlying permutation matrix by a transposition, this random variable changes by very little, by at most two, whereas this random variable here can change by a lot, it can, can change up to n. And um, 
that's uh, one of the key reasons why this random variable is much better behaved than this one with respect to concentration inequalities. Of course, there's a price to pay for this, and I'll not go into detail here in this talk, is that uh, calculating things about this random variable is much harder. So for example, understanding what is the expected number of, of disjoint objects, that's much harder to calculate uh, than the number of objects, expected number of objects itself. But it turns out for this particular application, uh, one can um, do that using some, uh, some tricks that were developed in the context of probabilistic combinatorics. Um, so, so one can actually uh, calculate these things or at least um, approximate them sufficiently to make the proof work. So um, this was kind of the high level glimpse that I wanted to, to give here about how this proof works is again, we first focus on uh, Costa's areas does not contain such a forbidden configuration. Then we reinterpret the quantity that we're interested in in terms of probability theory so that we um, have to bound what's the probability that the random um, permutation matrix contains no such configurations. Then for the purpose of the, tr the proof, one trick is instead of looking at the number of these objects, we look at some variant, which counts the maximum number of disjoint objects of this type. And that turns out to work. So, so, um, so if you're interested in more about how this argument works, you can look on my uh, web page where we have a, a, a preprint about this. But I think in general, this idea might also be useful in, in other contexts. It's, uh, it's used a lot in, in the context of random graphs, but maybe not so much outside. So I think it might be useful to, to keep in mind. Um, I wanted to, to mention one, uh, one open problem here also. I think it was uh, it's related to what was already asked. So uh, we, we still don't know too much about um, lower bounds on the number of these uh, costas arrays. So I mentioned that um, uh, the lower bounds typically come from explicit constructions. And if you look at them, they're all very much algebraic in nature. They exploit some, some number of theoretic things. And the kind of bounds you get is something like the number of costas arrays um, for n times n uh, arrays is at least say roughly n squared. So here I wrote n to the two minus epsilon it's probably in reality n squared divided by some logarithmic or polylogarithmic term, but that's the kind of thing that you get. So it's it's really really um, not too many, and um, so the the question really is, I think you know maybe uh, can one uh, uh, improve this kind of lower bound somehow, um, at least for infinitely many n. Of course, a uh, separate problem would be to to show, for example, that for uh, for all n. And there are these costas areas, though. Maybe that's too optimistic. You know, I would not be surprised. Maybe if for some end there actually is no costas area. So maybe for thirty-two there is none. Uh, I think that's a very realistic possibility. Um, but um, just to be sure, here I wanted to just indicate that if you actually look into these papers, they give explicit constructions uh, using uh, this case primitive roots of some field. And they um, they actually you can actually count how many uh, they give. Okay, so that's what I wanted to just uh, highlight here is that in many cases once you give constructions with parameters you can count how many they are, um, and that's how you get these kind of uh, lower bounds. Okay, so so that's kind of nice here. Um, there are these explicit algebraic constructions where you can play around with the with the parameters. In this case, you have this c and this alpha to play with. Um, they give you reasonably many, but the question is, can you do better? So for example, uh, I think it would really be interesting to construct n to the two plus epsilon, uh, many of such costas areas. Um, it's not clear how to do that. Uh, that I think would be quite interesting. Okay, so um, I think, let me just uh, wrap up. So we were looking at this um, n times n costas areas, which I here try to say, okay, we. They, they come from, have a certain motivation from these radar and sonar applications, but we can really think of them as permutation matrices with constraints. And the constraints are that we forbid certain sub configurations. Okay, so permutation matrices without certain sub configurations. Uh, then we showed that the fraction of these n times n costas areas among n factorial that decays exponentially. So that, you know, I verified this, uh, this, this, what was put forward by Drakakis as a core problem in the area. And I think the proof I find quite nice is because it uses this, these ideas from random graph theory in order to 
uh, answer this question regarding these uh, these costas areas. And I think this idea of looking instead of the um, number of objects that you're interested in at this variant, where you say, okay, how many disjoint objects are there? I, I, I do feel that, that might have some some applications in other areas as well. And the two uh, the questions I want to finish off with here is you know uh, can one maybe prove better lower bounds on C of n at least for infinitely many n? Maybe there are some algebraic constructions out there. And I think the other thing that was brought up during the talk I think would also be interesting to explore is to to understand if there are more connections here to uh, to the Fourier perspective. And with that, I'll stop here and open up for questions. All right, thanks so much. I'm gonna hit the, uh, sorry, Dustin, I'm gonna smash the reaction button and I encourage you all to as well. And uh, 